Welcome to the Nursing World Shared Practice Forum. I'm Marcy Brastoff, Director of Clinical Education and Informatics and Chief Nurse Informatics Officer at Boston Children's Hospital. I am privileged today to introduce Dr. Fenella Gill from Princess Margaret Hospital for Children, lecturer and researcher at Curtin University. Dr. Gill, please tell us about yourself. Oh, thank you, Marcy. Um, I'll just add that that's in, in Australia. I work in, in Western Australia. Um, my background, though, is that I um, trained in the UK. I did nursing um, education training in the hospital and um, then moved to Australia in the 19, 1980s and I've worked in Australia the last 25 years. Um, predominantly in um, pediatric critical care, I've worked um, initially as a clinician and then worked in education and um, then developed a postgraduate program in education in pediatric critical care and that really um, developed my interest in the standards for graduates of, of courses so in critical care because um, there really was um, not a consistent outcome with the standards so that was really the impetus for when I did um, explore a PhD topic that really um, became um, a natural topic for me to, to work on. Excellent. Talk to us a little about how you studied the methodology you chose to study for the standards. For me it was important that I was doing something really practical. So the study I did was designed in phases or stages so it was quite um, discrete phases and those um, that also worked well because I was really keen that I did my PhD by publication. So that means a series of, of papers or articles that are published. And so it needed to work in the PhD that that um, were, was um, discrete um, parts that lended themselves to, to being published as, as I went. So um, as I, as, as I um, indicated there, the, um, there was a lack of consistency or, or the standards for graduates of critical care nurse education varies widely in the Australian setting and of course as it does internationally, but I was really um, working on developing practice standards for the Australian setting. And so the first step was to undertake a literature review, so to look at practice standards internationally. And then the next part or the next part of collecting data was really to do an analysis of courses that were existing in Australia and um, even that I guess was not straightforward. I was able to identify 23 courses and um, 22 of those um, pe people that coordinated the courses or, or their um, employers were, uh, were able to provide me permission to, to include those in, in the analysis of courses. So I was able to interview course coordinators as well as um, obtain data about the curriculum and assessment because I was particularly interested in um, assessment um, of, of practice of, of grad, well, of, of students so that they were enabled to demonstrate they could graduate. Um, and I also um, looked at or, or analysed what information was available on their websites. So that was one phase. So that analysis then, it was, a, it was guided by using the standards of um, the World Federation as well as um, that, that, that had been translated to the European and Australian standards um, for position statement on what should be included in an education programme. So those position statements. Um, so I used those as a guide to, um, to analyse the data and, and in fact used that as an interview guide for the course coordinators. So that, um, that phase actually I, I did find at the time to be quite overwhelming because there was so much data I really had to be um, really focus on what was, what was it I was trying to get out of this part of the study because there was so much data. Um, but it was really looking at um, the factors that impacted on the graduate practice outcomes. So a question for our audience at home. Please note the city and country that you're living in and describe for us standards that may exist for nursing education and outcomes where you live. The next um, discrete part of data collection was identifying 
what health consumers was important, what they thought was important for graduates of courses to be able to do in practice. And I really, I can um, thank um, Dr. Jos Latour, who's one of my supervisors, um, and he really introduced that as being um, fundamental at the beginning of the project. So I thank him for that because I think that's been a re that's been a unique contribution to the project. Can you tell us what was the most interesting? findings that you learned from consumers, patients and families, I'm assuming, that you queried? I, I guess I was really um, pleased that um, that patients and families that really valued the psychosocial support that nurses were able to provide. So they were able to give lots of examples um, of how nurses could do that well. But I guess on, on, on the other hand, um, there were some a number of reports when that wasn't done so well and how that actually increased families and patients stress. So what was um, I guess a validation for me from coming from a pediatric critical care background was that th this um, um, part of the, the study was, was looking or, or exploring health consumers perspectives from um, adult as well as pediatric settings and so they all had the, the same um, the, sa the same value of what nurses do for them to support them is, is just as important as that physical care. Right. Did you do personal interviews with families and patients? Um, yes, so I had a, 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 a kind of a two-pronged strategy because I wanted to make sure I had a national perspective. So I went to, uh, in, so I'm from Western Australia, so I also um, traveled to um, three other states and territories so I um, did undertake focus groups and individual interviews because that worked out um, I guess just in a practical practical way to do some individual interviews as well yes they were all adult participants so the, those that had been patients had been adult patients in intensive care or coronary care there had been some parents though of children in intensive care that that participated uh, so for our audience at home Again, please remember to state the city and country that you're living in. And we're wondering, is there uh, the ability for consumers, patients, and families to state what is important to them for nursing education, for in development of standards for nursing education? Uh, can you tell us how you think the work that you've done has influenced education currently? Uh, in Australia? Well that's a, a still work in progress so that the next step after doing the, the three sources of data collection was to do an eDelphi, so online survey, um, engaged with over 100 critical care nurses. They were able to recruit actually um, through a number of different networks and through our um, Australian College of Critical Care Nurses. And so there were um, stakeholders um, from those that had expertise in standards development, those who coordinated courses, those who worked in practice in management education um, or in clinical practice itself um, and course graduates that those had recently graduated. So then they were asked um, in a three round Delphi to rate their level of agreement with the standards and also identify on a, on a, a five different categories what level of practice they thought was appropriate for a graduate of a course. What level of practice was identified as appropriate for a course? Were you able to, were, were people in agreement uh, across the different levels of um, the, the nurse in practice, the course coordinators? Did they, was there some agreement across those frames? Yes, there was. Um, I did look at um, whether there was a difference in, in um, responses between those different groups and no, there, there wasn't um, a, a significant difference, no. That's no. so good. Um, so th we got um, then, as a result of that process, th the draft standards. So the next step then was to test the standards as a, an assessment tool, so an instrument. So um, then there was more work in um, getting um, some validity and reliability testing and um, the participants in that were um, course coordinators, um, assessors who would be assessing learners in, in practice and they would usually be um, nurses who worked in an education role in clinical practice um, and then um, some recent graduates themselves so they self-identified was this appropriate for what you would have expected of yourself at that time. 
So that's what we've got now is we've got this assessment tool and standards of practice. So the next step will be then to move that forward so that um, it is actually taken up by course providers. So my next step is um, um, we'll be speaking with um, Australian College of Critical Care Nurses with the board to take that forward to um, incorporate it into their position statement for education for critical care um, nursing and um, to then um, that will disseminate to the course providers. So in, in, in the Australian context, course providers are predominantly at university, but there are also a few others that um, feed into university, but college or, or hospital-based programs. It's, it's such important work. There's, here in the United States, there's frequently a disconnect when we have students graduate and then move into clinical practice because we don't identify necessarily what's important once you're out and practicing. And uh, there's, there's sometimes that disconnect and it sounds like you've worked with all the stakeholders, including the consumers, uh, to make sure that people are prepared across the board and ready to practice once they're out there. So what are the implications internationally? How do you plan on moving this work that you're doing to an international stage? Yeah, well, that, that's a good question. And certainly um, in um, writing the um, six papers that I've had published as, as part of the PhD, um, in, in um, writing those, then I've, I've looked at the international perspective. And um, it, it, can, it can be quite hard to compare in, in, in between countries because um, there's different education systems and different practices. Uh, but most aligned with the Australian system would be in, in, in the UK. And um, the um, UK standards f um, for comp core competencies, um, they, um, the level of practice that's been articulated as um, appropriate for graduates of a, a post-registration program, it is a little bit different. It, there is a, high, a, a higher expectation um, of um, lead, take, taking more of a leadership role. So there's certainly an opportunity for more research because um, the process I've gone through has been driven and, and informed by consumers as well as nurses who work in, in the area as well as those that um, research in the area. Um, the UK standards have been developed by a, an expert group. So really whether they are translated into practice and graduates are really graduating at that advanced level, it's really not, not clear. So. There is opportunity for research there. Um, whether the you know the Australian expectation is is really lower than in the UK, I think um, the um, European situation is really diverse. You know between different countries, um, but there's a big move, as, as you'll be aware of, um, professionalisation of nursing and the move to the higher education. So. It, it really is um, a, a moving feast still. Um, some of the challenges that we've experienced in Australia that um, undergraduate education for nursing moved in, in, into the university sector in the 1990s, postgraduate education followed and um, had a, many influences that um, affected the outcome from, from courses that I'm talking about, uh, critical care education. Um, and there are generic graduate attributes that universities use as, as a standard and they're measured against, but there aren't those practice standards. So I think broadly um, in the Australian setting, the um, development of these practice standards has implications for other specialties, certainly. Um, but in, um, in across internationally, I, I guess it's really raising the flag that um, there needs to be a standard. Um, um, and there is no consensus what that standard looks like and there are always going to be real um, areas of excellence. But um, what we're looking at is to, for, for the public to be assured that there's a minimum standard. Absolutely. You know, as you're talking, I, I found myself wondering, how did you get interested in studying this? Um, probably one of the first questions I should have asked you, but how, how did you get to this well, um, my, my background was that I um, taught and coordinated a program 
for paediatric critical care and um, the whole area about clinical assessment in particular was was challenging and um, informally I'd benchmarked our program with other programs and saw that how how things could be so different and expectations were different depending on what type of hospital that students were had their clinical placements in whether it was a tertiary cardio unit where there was cardiothoracic surgery or open heart surgery um, compared to a more general critical care unit where it's um, graduate skills needed to be more broad um, with less support from medical staff so very very different context and environment so um, that was really gave me the impetus to um, to to um, to work on identifying a minimum standard. I guess the other driver is particularly in, in um, Australia we have this workforce standards that 50% or more of your staff have a critical care qualification but there is no uh, minimum standard what that what that qualification looks like so that was really um, another driver. Right in order to set the set the bar you exactly. absolutely have to have standards for practice at every level uh, or, or whatever acuity or setting that you're working in. Um, so in terms of getting the feedback back to families and patients that you interviewed and spoke to, have you done any work in that direction, letting them know what the work that you've accomplished to date? Yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, so at the time, um, as part of the um, data analysis, I did participant checking. So I did send back the themes that were identified to some of the participants who agreed that they would, you know, be able to to review the themes. Um, to follow up from, from their interviews. Um, and then uh, because I've um, undertaken the PhD by publication, then I was able to send the, the final journal article to all the participants. So I did make sure that I did that. I think that's um, really important to give to give that feedback. I mean, sure, there was a, there is a time lag with that, but I thought it was really important to do that. And that's something that we sometimes forget that we collect data from people, um, but we don't always let them know what the results are or give them that feedback. Absolutely, and that leads me to the nursing staff as well. I, the standards must help nurses at all levels, nurse educators, uh, professors, nurses in practice to have standards to look towards in order f in order to prepare. So have you had feedback from, from those people as well. Yes, I think um, generally the feedback is that it was it was important work that needed needed to be done. But um, there th there needs to be a, a drive uh, through our professions through the critical care nurses, um, uh, the co the Australian College in particular, to to really um, make that um, not not optional for course providers, so that they do need to um, to to use the those position statement, which will include the standards. But that's my my next step. I must say, I think it I think it still be work in progress. Mm -hmm. Dr. Gill, could you describe in some detail how you came to the PhD by publication method? Yeah, sure. Um, I'd had um, some colleagues who had um, undertaken their PhD that that way, and so I was aware of it. it certainly, it's not the usual um, route at my university at Curtin University, but. Um, it is a, an option. So what that really means is um, that it's, it's prospectively designed in that way so that um, the thesis um, looks like it is the, the publications that then is um, um, linked together or, or um, held together or, or explained by the, an introduction, uh, background, conceptual framework and then the series of publications are the body of the work and then in, in my, my thesis there was a, a discussion then um, that linked it all together and made recommendations. So in, it's instead of having um, separate chapters in a thesis so it actually is more condensed but from a point of view of um, getting information out there um, it was. Um, I, I, could, I couldn't have done a written a thesis and, and 
presented my work in, in, in the same way to be able to um, share and disseminate the findings, which was so important in, in, in this um, process that I was really relying on um, critical care nurses to support the project. So I'd be able to give them feedback because I was publishing as I went was really important. Um, and um, to be able to um, do that in a timely way because, you know, a PhD, I did, I did it full time. So I, I took leave from my position. So I did complete it in three years and, and got the publications. Um, whereas if I'd done a traditional thesis, then I would be then looking at publishing afterwards. Um, so it, I think it, it, it's advantageous in my career in academia for sure that I've um, now I've got those six publications that have, some are beginning to be cited. So it's um, it's it's certainly given me a, a an advantage. There's something so efficient and productive simultaneously to be, to doing what you did, and it also lets the people know that you've worked with that you're using the information they've given you they've given you and and so many other people will have access to it simultaneously yeah and I guess that some of the other um, advantages are that I've got the skills to be able to write in in, um, in, in, a, in in article form rather than the different skills that you get from writing a thesis but I would definitely argue that um, it's much more useful to be able to write a paper that can be published than be able to write a thesis and um, certainly there's others that would um, would disagree with that and, and, not, and not all topics would lend themselves to that right. sort of style I think that's probably so something to be clear about I've certainly planned the project from the beginning that it was a series of um, of um, steps or phases that built on each other um, so they did lend themselves to being able to publish as, as I went and that was certainly in my, my planning in that three years that was to get those papers done in, the, in a timely way because there's such a long, um, a long time frame with um, submitting for publication and actually having your, your paper published. Right, so to translate the work immediately so that it can be used, it's, it's a, it was a brilliant idea. So um, I, I guess um, just further with that then, um, it will, would depend on the university's policy. Um, I've just presented um, at Plymouth University where it's not actually um, an option currently and that we pre presented with my supervisor Jos Latour as well as my principal supervisor Gavin Leslie. Um, we spoke around it and, and it was actually um, caused quite a lot of discussion because that's not a mode that's currently available. Um, but um, you know, it'd be, it'd be nice to think that maybe we're going to make start change happening. Um, and, and the audience was was um, not a nursing audience; it was you know a university um, academic audience. So yeah. How was it received? Well, mixed. Some people thought it was a good idea, but others um, perhaps that work in areas where it wouldn't lend itself to publication. That um, maybe they had more more difficulty to get their head around that. So a question for our audience at home. Please state your city and country and tell us in your city and country, do you have a PhD by publication available to you? I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Gill for her infinite knowledge and wisdom and joining us here at the Nursing World Shared Practice Forum. Thank you, Dr. Gill. Thank you.